Hello, and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental nerds, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Nick and I discuss Nick's trip to the Amazon. Then we talk to Rachel Crane about ecotourism, bubble netting, and National Geographic. And finally, dolphins sleep with one side of their brain at a time. They can't sleep like we do because they have to be able to surface to breathe. To work around this, dolphins allow only one half of their brains to sleep. The other half stays alert to enable the dolphins to continue to breathe and look out for dangers in the environment. Dolphins also sleep one eye open while they sleep, with the left eye closing while the right side of their brain sleeps, and vice versa. This type of sleep is known as unihemispheric sleep. Dolphins alternate which half of the brain is sleeping periodically so that they can get the rest they need without ever losing consciousness. Where's my cheers, Nix? You got I mean, this. <laughs> that was impressive. You got this sound machine and I didn't get any cheers for my unihemispheric I mean, I mean, on the spot yeah. read. You know what you're right. <laughs> that was incredible. I'm proud Woo! of you. Really <laughs> <laughs> ah, I hate that music. NAAP's South Carolina chapter is hosting a webinar on invasive plant management on Wednesday, June 7th from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. This workshop will provide landowners and forestry professionals information on invasive plants in South Carolina and methods for their management. Training professionals will teach participants pesticide basics, including safety, active ingredients, and trade names. Identification and management methods for common woody plants, grasses, and understory plants will be discussed. An afternoon field tour will include hands-on demonstrations of mechanical invasive species control and herbicide application methods in different forest systems. Please check out www.naap.org for more details. We appreciate all of our awesome sponsors, and there we keep the show going. If you'd like to sponsor the show, please head on over to environmentalprofessionalsradio.com and check out the sponsor form for details. Let's get to our segment. You went to the Amazon? Yeah. yeah I've been. When the heck was that? Uh, that was right before the Galapagos. I mean, was, I've heard about Galapagos like 400 times, but I don't remember <laughs> you talking about the Amazon. Yeah, no, we went to the Amazon right before it, actually. So we did uh, the Peru, um, you know, we did go to Machu Picchu. Um, but we, before that, we went to the Amazon. And actually, this is one of those travel horror stories where we flew from Miami to Lima. And we mm-hmm. got to, we landed in Lima at like midnight. It was super early in the morning. And it happened to be like their craziest festival of the year. So it is like. <laughs> and you didn't know this? You know, no, I had no clue. Because I, you know, why would I look up what's going on in the city at the time? <laughs> right. it's a really foolish young version of me made that mistake. It's like their most festive time of year. So everything is crazy everywhere. And everyone's trying to have fun. And we get there and there's no suitcases for us. None. Oh. And so I'm trying. And there's nobody in the airport. Nobody to give us any guidance. So I'm calling people. We have a driver that has to take us. He's like, I got to go. We got to go. It's going to take you forever. We got to go. And so I'm in the hotel room at like one in the morning trying to figure out where our bags are. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. We know exactly where your bags are. They're in Miami. (laughs) And I was like, that's great. I'm in Lima. (laughs) So that's not helpful. And then and then they're like, "Okay, well, don't worry. We'll send them to your next destination. And I was like, that's great. Our next destination is the Amazon where there is no airport and you know we're going to be <laughs> like hours out of communication from anything and they're like oh yeah we should probably get them to you beforehand and he's like don't worry they'll be at the airport right and this Wait, is like this, this is a fun thing. trip or work trip this was for fun this was vacation okay and so we finally get to a point because I talked to so I mean it's 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 exhausting you understand you know this stuff it never goes yeah. simply so finally like don't worry when you land at your next destination, before you get on the boat, your bags will be there. And I'm like, okay, I hope that's true. And it's, you know, and so, so we're nervous. We wake up at 4 a.m. That's right. We, we slept for like two hours <laughs> and we're walking out to go to the airport. And the woman that checked us in was like, hey, your bags are here. <laughs> <laughs> she just happened to see us. And it was almost, we almost walked away with nothing. Right. And just... And, you know, this is like a life advice. My wife did not pack anything in her carry-on that she could use for a second day. I had three pairs of clothes because I've done this before. Right. <laughs> I've had a bag get lost. You know? um, but no, that was brutal. But the trip itself was was amazing. We went up to, there was a, a community in the area that had basically converted some of their land for ecotourism. And mm. they built their own 
open air huts. And you'd think in the Amazon, it would be brutally hot and it was warm. You know, it wasn't like a four star hotel, but it was still cool. It was still really fun to do and go to. Was it what you might call tropical? It was tropical. That's right. We had uh, a wide range of people with us. So some people were older, some people were younger. There were three college age women that just, they would do the thing where they're like wearing, like they're going to the beach, right? So they're basically in swimsuits. And they're like, man, these mosquitoes sure are crazy, aren't they? (laughs) You know, we're in like full like field gear, you know, because we know that this is what happens. (laughs) It's just like, I had to be young, you know? (laughs) That's really cool. I did not know you went to the Amazon. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was incredible. We saw, you know, plants, birds, all kinds of wildlife. Um, Wrestle any anacondas? We did not see any anacondas. We did see caiman. That was cool. Mm. And, uh, you know, we got to see some endangered birds that were only in that one area, which was really neat. A lot of poison dart frogs, actually. Oh, cool. And our guide was so good. And uh, he actually, uh, <laughs> he saw my name. And, he's, and so my name is spelled like the Spanish version of Nicholas. So he's like, ah, oh, Nicolas. And I was like, <laughs> you can call me Nick. And he's like, oh. <laughs> I was like, but you can, you can call me Nicolas. That's fine. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> he was a great guy. Absolutely fantastic. And he was just like frog and you would, we were just walking by and it's all green and he finds a green and black yeah. frog. Just incredible eyes. Yeah. A good guide makes all the difference. Yeah. Kind of a trip. Yeah. Well, that's so, really I mean, cool. Yeah. But you, you, you haven't done that, but you've done other things. Yeah. You know? No, I, you know, I've never been to South America. Really? Yeah. Ah, I've been somewhere you haven't. How about that? <laughs> You've been, yeah. And the Galapagos. Which uh, we well, all know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. no, I have not been to Machu Picchu. Um, right. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, I will say to Machu Picchu, it is beautiful. It is gorgeous. And they do actually a good job managing the amount of people that go in. So we were actually up there on the most perfect day and all by ourselves in, in one oh, spot. Sweet. But the town is basically like, Welcome America. Isn't it so great to be in America? You're like, no, we're in, we're in no. Peru. <laughs> yeah. so I don't want to eat a uh, cheese pizza or what you think is a cheese pizza. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> cheese Trust pizza me. with a guinea pig? No. I mean, they, they do have a lot of that too. They're like, wouldn't you like to try a guinea pig? And I'm like, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just crying the whole time. Oh, <laughs> Oh man, again, we always go dark. I think it's time to get, that's an indication (laughs) it's time to get to our interview. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Hello and welcome back to EPR. Today we have Rachel Crane, who's an independent contractor that works as a science communicator, explorer, and mentor. Welcome, Rachel, or should I say Captain Rachel? (laughs) You could call me Captain. (laughs) 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 Oh man, it's, uh, it's, you know, looking through... um, your bio and all your interests, it's really hard to figure out where to start. I mean, you wear a lot of different hats. So when people ask you what you do, what do you tell them? It's a lot. I, I tell them that I work for myself and I utilize like my degrees and my skills to work, make money through a lot of different companies. And then I typically find out what do they actually want to know about me? Do they want to know that I'm the director of education and training for an agency and talk to me about scuba diving? That I'm a mostly retired dive instructor, (laughs) that I'm a captain and I drive vessels for a bunch of different reasons, or do they want to know about the fact that I work for ships that have the words National Geographic on the side? And and then I kind of see what they want to know more about. That's so funny, because guess what my next question is? So um, you have ties to National Geographic. (laughs) So interesting. Um, (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and you travel the ocean as a member of a field staff team aboard the Lindblad expedition as well for Nat Geo. How did you get into this? Okay. So how did I get into this? So I work for a company called Lindblad Expeditions mm-hmm. and they're partnered with National Geographic. I got into it because I got really burned out of being a dive instructor. So scuba diving. And I mm-hmm. left the Florida Keys with my partner and I moved to Alaska. About as far away as I could get. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think so. (laughs) Yeah. We lived and worked in Glacier Bay National Park, Alaska, which is Southeast Alaska. And that particular property has a dock. And so ships dock at the dock. Such a surprise. (laughs) And so one day 
a ship with the words National Geographic was sitting at our dock and all these people got off it. And so we're all like, what is this? Mm -hmm. So I got to ask them a lot of questions. Then I Googled the company and that's how I found them. Now, five years later, I decided that I was ready for that part of my journey and I applied with them. And it took me five years from seeing them and understanding what they were to actually decide that I was ready to apply for that job, that company and work for them. And then I got hired six months later. So it took a while for the <laughs> whole process. So what do you actually end up doing for them then? Yeah. All right. My title is, I have many of them, but if you were going to Google it within the company, I would come up as an undersea specialist. I also work as a naturalist slash expedition diver on board. And what does all that mean? It means that I'm a naturalist that specifically focuses on the ocean and I'm part of the scuba diving team on board. So Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic take guests out into wild places and show them nature. And then we have this field staff on board, which is what I'm part of. And we are your naturalists. And there's different types of naturalists. You've got your National Geographic photo instructor. You have generalists. You might have a glaciologist or a geologist or a bird person. And I'm your ocean person. And I also... Limblad's really cool because they have scuba diving on board. Now it's not for the guests. It's typically just two professionals, so two of your naturalist staff, and we gear up and go underwater with cameras and take videos of all the little things that we find. Who knows what it's going to be? <laughs> in Alaska, underwater in Alaska. Oh yeah. We, oh great. Okay. Oh yeah. So yeah, super warm, very warm water. So warm. <laughs> yeah, I do polar diving when I get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> but sense. I live in Key Largo, Florida. So there's like slight disconnect. <laughs> but, and I only go to polar places during their summers. Yeah, smart. That's smart. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm smart about it. <laughs> but yeah, so we, we go down there. We take videos of whatever we find. Sometimes we're the first people to ever dive in that place ever. So we have no idea what's down there. And we come back, get warm, and then edit the footage and show it to the guests, typically within about 24 hours, and show oh, them wow. what we found. So when you're diving in cold water like that, I mean, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you have a dry suit, so you're all the way covered, but it still has to be ice cold. Like how long can you actually stay down there? <laughs> yeah. So and how, are, and how far are you going down? Yeah. How deep? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we, we stay above a hundred feet wherever we are, but we're in very remote places. So it's very dangerous. So most of the time we're within 30 to 60 feet deep because after that, the risks of diving are just increased. And if something were to go wrong, helps really far away. So we are, we definitely have to manage that, you know, unless you can guarantee me that there's like octopus at 80 feet fighting, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to try to find the octopus at 30 feet. So, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then we wear dry suits. Now dry suits don't necessarily keep us warmer than a wetsuit. It just takes us longer to get cold. Mm. <laughs> so I am a warm person. I have lemonade for blood, not molasses. <laughs> <laughs> and so regardless of what I wear, I mean, in Alaska, Last summer, the average temperature was like 37, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm, so goodness. I was cold in about 15, 20 minutes. And we stay down for somewhere between 45 and 60 minutes. So by the end of it, you know, I'm just shit. Right. <laughs> 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 and we don't move around much because we're filming. So we're kind of like sitting in one spot and hanging out with whatever organism critter we found. So you're freezing because you're not doing anything. So mm -hmm. every once in a while, we just have impromptu dance parties. We're like, okay, <laughs> I got to get warm. <laughs> Could you just like dance with your buddy for a minute? Yeah. And you know, there's like a seal looking at you like, who are these crazy people in this water? Was, yeah. That's hilarious. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of seals and sea lions, it just sounds a little bit terrifying, a little bit thrilling. And then I don't know about the cold. I don't. 
that paycheck would have to be pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> there is part of it that you do because you just love it, not for the mm. money. Oh yeah. I've I have yet to be fortunate enough to run into a pinniped underwater. So no sea lions or mm. seals for me underwater yet, but a lot of my coworkers have and they're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. See, I've seen those videos. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's that is really cool. And I can only imagine for people listening, they're still wondering, how do you get that job? So you said you followed them for five years. I mean, were you looking at what what the job requirements were and trying to build those skills or did you just happen to have those skills they were looking for? Did you do anything to try to ingratiate yourself with them, meet people there and kind of make yourself known? Like I know lots of people who are trying to break into marine science in particular, and they find it very difficult. But then we talk to you and Tiffany and JD, and it's like, oh, yeah, I just got this job. (laughs) (laughs) You make it sound so easy. So what were the other details in that career search that's involved? And did you become a captain before then or after then? Is that one of the skills they were looking for? So when I found the company, I wasn't a captain yet, but I wanted to be a captain. So it's part of the reason I didn't immediately throw my hat in the ring because I had professional goals for myself and they were specifically looking for individuals that had a United States Coast Guard captain's license. That does Mm -hmm. make you stand out above and beyond anything else because they have to have a certain number of licensed drivers on the expedition ships in places so we can drive the guests in the little Zodiacs. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you are a geologist with a captain's license, they like you better than just the geologist. So that one's huge. And I already wanted that. And I already wanted to have experience actually being a captain of vessels, not just have a license in my hand, like a driver's permit. Yeah. Yeah. What's entailed with that? Is that kind of like getting a a driver's permit somewhere between driver's permit and flying a helicopter or how much is involved? (laughs) Yeah. So you have to have days at sea. If you just want a basic, like it's called a six pack, like six passengers. So um, P-A-X packs. You need 360 days at sea. You can only count a calendar day once. So January 1st only happens once a year. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have four hours at sea. So four hours away from dock out at sea to count that day on board a vessel. You can do anything be a dive master, an instructor, a first mate, whatever. But that's how you count the day. I have a hundred ton license. So that's 720 days at sea. And then you actually have to take a big course through the Coast Guard typically takes, you can go do it in two weeks or I studied online. It took me two months to study. Then you test and then you do all the paperwork and there's lots of money involved in this. But by lots, I mean, probably less than two grand for the course and all of the other, like you have to have a a physical, a drug test, all this other stuff you have to do. So the return on investment is high, right? Faster than your degrees. Uh, (laughs) You know, you put two grand into it. Once you're licensed and working, you can make it back probably in your first month. That's awesome. That's really good to know. As much as I drove boats in my last job, I probably should have considered that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it makes you very opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Right. Um, So that was part of it was I wanted to be a captain. So I was so working on, I had all my days at sea when I found them. So I was doing the courses and then I wanted several years actually driving vessels before I looked into traveling for work. I do have degrees. So having some type of degree is important. They just care that it's some type of natural degree, any kind of science. So mine are ecology and marine biology. So I'm a marine ecologist by degrees. And then diving, if you're specifically looking at the diving, that's a bit more involved. So I am a master instructor through PADI. So there's only technically one level above me, which is a course director, somebody that trains instructors to become instructors. So I'm Mm -hmm. right under that level. And I wanted to achieve that level before I applied for that job. So I was still climbing that particular ladder and becoming a captain and I wanted to achieve those. So I, yeah, I wanted to bat 95% when I applied to this job, I didn't want to come in at 70. (laughs) Um, So I had things to check off for myself. Now I actually didn't know a soul when I applied with them. 
when I thought about applying, but during the time that I found them and I was doing my own stepping stones, one mm-hmm. of my friends actually started posting that she worked for them. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, whoa, I haven't talked to you in forever, but I want to work for them. And oh, so I amazing. reconnected with her and then she put in a good word for me. This particular company, you can cold apply for most of the field staff positions, like your naturalist. It is harder to get a job, but with the scuba diving part, it's almost impossible unless some, one of the divers like knows you or has interacted or dived with you. So they can kind Mm -hmm. of vouch for you because what we do, it's so incredibly diverse as well as safety forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was fortunate in that I did end up knowing somebody, but it was kind of out of the, out of the blue that I knew them. That's awesome though. I, I swear the universe hands you what you need <laughs> you know, if you're looking for it. So that's fantastic. And then speaking of diving, so I worked at a dive shop for several years. And so I know firsthand that it's not always an easy space to be a woman in and be taken seriously. And so what's been your experience with that? And what have you learned over the years being a, a female dive instructor? Yeah, I will say I've been incredibly fortunate that most of my coworkers were fantastic. Yeah. And supportive of just me and that I had knowledge and that I was, can I say badass? Because yeah. that's badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they were really supportive and that was kind of a great environment to be in. I had very few, uh, like maybe two people that I could think of that were not great. Most of the time when I was in that space and I was working, because I, I worked up to instructor and then I was still in that space when I worked up to captain. It's the clientele, actually, where Mm -hmm. uh, you get the most pushback and annoying situations, frustrating, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you're not respected for your knowledge and your abilities. So I can definitely cite that. Like simple things like you go up to somebody like, how much weight do you need before they go diving? And they're like, oh, I'm fine. And then your male coworker goes up and says, how much weight do you need? And they're like, well, I'm not sure. I've never dove this butt seat before. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's a simple... (laughs) Silly things like that. And I've had things where I'm the only female on the vessel. And so I'll go around, help get divers situated. And then they're like, when are we leaving? And one of my coworkers is like, when the captain says we're ready, they, they got to get the manifest and everything. They're like, oh, cool. When does he get there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. like, she's right here. Yeah. She's, yeah. <laughs> it blows their minds when I yeah. run an all female crew. They have no idea what to do. So sometimes that's really funny. (laughs) Yeah. But most of the time, people are really excited by it, especially if there's other women divers, they're stoked. So yeah, I've had a mixed bag, which I feel like most women have, but nothing super duper crazy. Yeah, but you're doing it anyway because you're badass. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and speaking of, you're also uh, the director of education and training with Dive Heart, which is a scuba training agency that focuses on building confidence, independence, and self-esteem. And you do that through scuba diving, scuba therapy, and other related activities, which sounds really incredible. But I got to know, what on earth is scuba therapy? <laughs> so scuba therapy, have you heard of individuals that do maybe like horseback riding as therapy? Mm-hmm. So maybe to recover from an injury, maybe to gain confidence in themselves if they have a cognitive ability that's different than what you might expect to be normal. Mm -hmm. So that's a type of therapy where they build confidence. And you can do the same thing with scuba diving. So we, Dive Heart works specifically with adaptive divers and adaptive divers are children, adults, and veterans with disabilities. And some of these individuals have been told They couldn't do things for their whole lives, including scuba diving. You know, you look at somebody in a wheelchair and they're like, no, you can't be a scuba diver. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes they can. Mm -hmm. And so we have programs that we offer where they can come try diving for free, for fun. And they'll find that they can do it and they like it. And then they can segue into getting certified through Dive Heart. And then the biggest goal Some of the adaptive divers are comfortable enough that they can go on trips for vacation and go scuba diving. 
And so it's kind of changing how people view them and how they view themselves. And that's the, the therapy part of it. They're not Joe in a wheelchair. They're Joe, the scuba diver. Yeah. That's so, really awesome. Yeah. yeah. I know, what drew you to that? So when I was working in the Florida Keys, becoming a dive instructor and a captain, Dive Heart would come to the Florida Keys to run trips. And they ran them through one of the shops I used to work for. And so I was just a crew member at that shop. And I would always volunteer to work those trips. And they were like my favorite things. It's like Dive Heart's in town for a week. I was like, cool, I want on every trip. Yeah. And I would just go be the guide and be part of it because it was the most rewarding, special thing ever. And then eventually they were hiring and I was looking for a new job. Hmm. So it just kind of aligned really well. Yeah, that's, a, well, that's really incredible. I'm really thankful that you get to do that. It sounds really rewarding, which is you know what we all want, I think, out of all of our careers in general. So I'm glad you get to do that. And yeah. uh, but you also get to travel quite a bit. And I want to know a little bit about your most recent project in the Bahamas and Belize. Yeah. Oh, man. So hmm. the dive heart role is completely remote. So I've had a remote job way before they were cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's more about my knowledge level and maintaining kind of risk management and safety and course curriculum than it is actually being there in person anymore. So I'm mostly retired from teaching. And now when I scuba dive, it's typically for fun or for Limblad expeditions. So let's see, it's March right now. So since January, I worked a couple weeks in Belize for Limblad and then a few weeks in the Bahamas. I just got home from the Bahamas. We're talking just a couple, it's, a, it's days now. It was hours. <laughs> we appreciate you hours. just stepping up it to was. the plate here and taking this on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So pretty much what the expeditions do, their goal is to go to wild places. So in Belize, we were on some of the outer islands. If you don't know, Belize and Honduras are part of the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, mm -hmm. which is the second largest barrier reef in the world. So Australia has the Great Barrier Reef, then Belize and Honduras for Mesoamerica, and then the Florida Keys where I live. Hey. <laughs> hey, so pretty easy. And all the critters in Belize and in the Bahamas underwater, they're the same critters I have in my backyard. So <laughs> that's why I go there as the undersea specialist, because I'm like, hey, these are the fish I see every day uh, <laughs> right. in a new place. So I'm pretty well prepared to kind of talk about them and tell the stories of those critters. So I was in Belize and gosh, I saw some of the healthiest coral in the tropical Western Atlantic is technically the largest umbrella that I can put over this area mm -hmm. uh, that I've ever seen in my life. I cried wow. at least three times uh, <laughs> just from seeing healthy coral. Yeah. And then we also have other aspects. So that's a snorkeling itinerary for guests. So guests get to go snorkeling. We did some jungle cruises and saw monkeys and parrots and mm. all the, all the cool stuff did some yeah, river cruises was where we did the monkeys. And then in the Bahamas, the Bahamas is a totally different landscape. There's no jungles. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I was actually laughing. The highest point in the Bahamas is 207 feet, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> which beats Key Largo really, really a lot because the highest point in actually the entirety of the Florida Keys is 19 feet. Oh my so gosh. So <laughs> they had us beat. I went to visit some elevation. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. Calm down over there. <laughs> you get a nosebleed? Are you okay? Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anytime like, I'm we went over. Altitude. <laughs> anytime we went over a sand hill, I was like, yeah. oh, guys, elevation. <laughs> So it was, she's it on was a horse. Crazy. She's like, it's so high up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm getting dizzy. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, man. I used to show horses. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah. Why not? That's in there too. There you go. Um, but yeah, so the Bahamas was really interesting because Limblad Expeditions has never run an itinerary in the Bahamas before, ever. So it was true expeditioning. We 
no one had ever been any of these places we were going. So we were showing up and getting up early in the morning and going out on scouts to be like, what is this? What can we do here? Can we kayak? Can we snorkel? I don't know. <laughs> and so every day was kind of a, what exactly are we doing again? Right. And how do you say the name of this island? <laughs> <laughs> so it was very challenging, but the place is stunning. Like I, the Florida Keys, I think it's 60 miles by, yeah, like away from parts of the Bahamas. And there's a part of Miami that's only 45 miles from the Bahamas. So it's, it's blocking my view of the Atlantic. <laughs> 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 so it was really neat to go over there and get to see some of those islands that most people will never get to go to because we were primarily in the most southern out islands, like yeah. closer to the Caymans, actually. So very, very cool exploring. I saw my first wild flamingos. That was neat. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So yeah, I said, we're supposed to we're, we're supposed to get to the jealousy portion of the interview later. Um, <laughs> so we're here now. That's great. But uh, with that kind of thing comes science communication, right? Which is really important. So I want to know like what that what does that mean to you, and how do you use your experiences, like what you're talking about right now, to teach others of varying education levels? Yeah. So pretty much everything I do on board is science communication. We'll go snorkeling and people will be like, I saw this fish. And I don't just help them learn the name of the fish. I'm helping them learn what's that fish do when you're looking at it? What's he doing for his day? Why is that important to the reef? Why is the reef important to the ocean? Why is the ocean important to the planet? <laughs> and why, do, why does it matter when you live in Idaho? You know? Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really fun because there's so many little stories to tell. And I really like, you know, we've got this critter in front of us right now, this experience in front of us. And I like upgrading it to a worldview and to a why it matters view, which is probably the ecologist in me, which is the yeah. whole, how is everything connected? And then I try to do it in a way that's really fun and not necessarily as many big science words. You know, I, I know a lot of big science words, but the people that I'm trying to get to care more don't. Mm -hmm. And so they can be a bit of a barrier. So I try to speak as much in layman's terms as possible. Or if I ever use a word that might be an unknown word, I, be, I stop, you know, partway through whatever I'm doing. And I'm just like, and that just means, or I say, a lot of times I say that's science for mm -hmm. whatever yeah. it actually is. So it's translating a lot into just information that they can digest and that they can turn around and share because they're excited about. So getting them excited that like, so, all right, here's, here's a crazy one. So the Bahamas <laughs> is one of two places in the world that you can find the oldest living fossil on the planet. Really? They look like rocks. Mm. They look like rocks. Huh. And so, and they're called stromatolites. Oh. What are you going to do with that word? Yeah. All right. So stromatolites are cyanobacteria. That's not helpful. It basically <laughs> means like algae, something that photosynthesizes and makes mm -hmm. a hard skeleton and therefore rocks. Right. And they're ancient. And the only two places in the world that you can find them are the Bahamas and Australia. So we were able to see these fossils and they're in Kind of where the waves break on a beach. Mm -hmm. uh, so as the tide pulls back and you can see everything draining, you see the rocks. Mm -hmm. And then the wave crashes, you can't really see it. And most of the time you're like, cool, rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and and so we get to be like, no, 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 these there's like two places in the world you see these rocks. People come from all over the world to see these rocks. And now people are excited because they learned about that and they take pictures of it and they can go tell everyone like, yeah, this island's protected because of these fossils, these rocks. And, yeah, yeah. and now they care about them. Yeah, so yeah, but it's such a strange concept to be like, okay, this rock is cool because. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Living fossil, ancient yeah. living fossil. I love fossil. that, yeah. What'd you do in the Bahamas? I saw some cool rocks, you know? And I... <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know what it's called, but it was cool. Yeah, it was super cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two places, you know? Yeah, but I love that, though. It's totally true. That's, like, exactly it. You want to take a big thing and make it simple. And then mm -hmm. it, it's much easier for them to talk about it. And then 
you know, someone like me hears that. And if you don't think I'm going to research this after the, the interview, <laughs> you're crazy. You don't know me. Um, but I love that, you know, because, you know, I learned something too. Okay. Ancient rocks, two places. That's what I'm going to look for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, and you got to boil it down to that. Like what are, you know, the buzzwords yeah. like to make it the most important. So you have to kind of plow through all of the, like how does cyanobacteria work and all of that. And just, no, 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 boil it down to these things and that's what yeah. sticks with them. And makes it something they want to tell because they're like, I saw something you can only see in two places in the world. And now they're going to talk about it. Right, exactly. That's really cool. And I'm really thankful you get to do that. And there's just seems like there's a lot of freedom in what you do, which has to be exhilarating and terrifying all at once. So like, what are the pros and cons for working the way that you do? Okay. (laughs) There are cons. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I mean, the pros are... When I'm there, it's really fun to see these new places, to share them. I'm doing something different every day, every hour of every day. Like I'm the captain of a little Zodiac and then I'm leading a hike and then I'm scuba diving and then I'm eating lunch. And then, (laughs) um, and then, you know, this afternoon we're going to go see a glacier and I'm going to drive that Zodiac. And then in Mm -hmm. the evening, I'm going to present to you about why whales are important. And so it's insane. I think my record for how many times I've changed my clothes in a day is about nine (laughs) (laughs) because you're just constantly changing outfits for what you're doing. Yeah. 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 In the evenings we dress fancy. So there's a lot of fun in all of that. And that's exciting. It is work to pre prepare some of those talks and to edit footage in like less than 24 hours. And (laughs) you never, sit down, which is fun, but also I miss couches. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the big cons are the classic, like away from my partner, you know, away mm. from, from my critters. And so less quality time at home. And then when you are at home, just, it takes a few days before you're human, which yeah. welcome to my few days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so that can be a lot. And when you're gone, another con we're in wild places and wild places don't have cell service and wild places don't have good Wi-Fi. Mm. So it's really hard to maintain a level of communication with the people that are back home, you know, that makes it easy to maintain that relationship. It's hard. I like cuddles. And Mm. so you like have to turn to your coworkers and and be like, so are you somebody that will give me hugs every day? (laughs) Every day. (laughs) So like all these, you know, these things, it's like, I don't have, you know, a kitty to sit on my lap and pet. I don't have somebody that I can just always turn and be like, I need a hug. (laughs) I don't need to listen to my problems. I just need a hug. Right. Right. My coworkers are awesome. So most of them are hugging people, but still, COVID made that weird too. Yeah. So yeah, so there's definitely pros, pros and cons, but it's worth it. I try our contracts are typically between a week to five weeks long. And with travel, you can go ahead and add an extra maybe two days on either side. So five weeks is closer to six when all is said and done. Yeah. And that can be a lot. So I definitely have to set boundaries of like, hey, you know this time of my life and what's going on with me right now, three weeks on board is my limit. But come yeah. fall when I'm, you know, maybe in a better mental space or more financially secure for the whole year. Yeah. Then I'll do six weeks on board. So boundaries are big. Yeah. Mental boundaries and time boundaries, because, you know, at the end of the day, that's what you have. Yeah. It's you. Yeah. So you have to take care of those things and prioritize them. And even though Alaska is amazing, mm-hmm. I kind of like the person that's sitting on my couch a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Making an awful lot of noise. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you only dropped one thing. One thing. Just one thing. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but no, it's really good perspective because I think a lot of times all of this sounds really whimsical and, and amazing and it can be draining as well. So I think it's really important for people to hear that. So yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Mm-hmm. Um. Nick is now, cheating, by the way, his wife is not home, I don't think. So Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No one there to be making noise. Yeah. Just me. 
But now it's time uh, for what we're calling our field fails segment, which is really more like a let's make Nick jealous segment. That's kind of the whole point of this thing. And you have a lot of great stories and you've been, <laughs> you've seen humpbacks bubble netting, which makes me furious because I'm so jealous to see that. So I know some people don't know what that is. So maybe explain what bubble netting is and then tell us how you managed to see that. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of cool. I will preface with saying that before I knew a lot about whales, I did not understand why people liked whales. Okay. I was not the marine <laughs> biologist that wanted to train the dolphins. I did not want to go do any of the whales or the orca stuff. I was like, okay, cool. Whales. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I really like whales, guys. <laughs> they grow on you. Yeah. Um, so bubble netting is a feeding behavior that humpback whales exhibit. Now, an individual whale can do this by themselves. And what they do is they dive down typically under like herring, a school of little fishes or krill, which are like teeny shrimps. And the whale will go down and they hold their breath with a bunch of bubbles when they go down and then they exhale. And remember they have blow holes on the top of their head. So they exhale and they swim in a circle and they come up kind of in a spiral where they continue to exhale. And so they create this wall of bubbles that goes straight up and all of the little fishes or the little krills are stuck inside. And then eventually the whale stops going around the outside and it comes underneath and opens its mouth and it comes straight up like the eye of the tornado mm -hmm. and it gets all the fishes and krills in its mouth. It explodes out <laughs> at the top and it's, <laughs> it's very dramatic and all the birds <laughs> at the top are very happy and there's like fishes and krills jumping everywhere. That's awesome. And so it's really neat. And it's one of the ways that they can feed in Southeast Alaska. Specifically, you see cooperative bubble net feeding, which means that more than one <laughs> whale does it together. Mm -hmm. So they work as this huge team. And what's wild is they're not related to each other. It's not mom and baby or mom and like grandkids from like three years ago or whatever. They're not related. They're like, Bros and hoes, they don't care. And <laughs> <laughs> so they're just all together as friends. And they come in and they all dive together. Like they all get together in like this little organized kind of pod. And then it's like somebody literally says, dive, dive, dive. And they all go down right after each other really quick. And they divide the roles. So somebody's the bubble netter and they go down and blow the bubbles and create the little bubble tornado that goes up. And then the other whales will circle around to kind of push the little things into a tighter pack. And then there's another job and they are the vocalist and they scream bloody murder mm -hmm. <laughs> at these little fishes and krills on an octave that they know for a fact that the little heron herrings, the little fishes can hear and it's terrifying. Oh and wow. <laughs> and then they all get underneath at the same time together and they all come out of the water together with their mouths open and it's absolutely insane. Yeah, if you were if you put your ears, like if you got in the water while they were doing this, it's so loud that it could pierce your eardrums. Oh what? gosh. So typically we just put a hydrophone in the water and listen that way. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> it's yeah. nuts. It's so loud. You can actually, like if you're on a ship and you go down to the lowest part that's under the water and like put your ear up to the metal, you can hear it. Oh my gosh. Through the ship. So that's crazy. But I've seen this because I've been working in Southeast Alaska for many summers. And so that's one of the places this happens. And I've had two specific crazy experiences with it. One of them gets better, Nick. Oh, he's oh, gets better, Nick. Oh my goodness! You wanted to be jealous. So, I mean, so. <laughs> do you I'm gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> so now you understand what's happening. So, I was driving a Zodiac, which is a small inflatable vessel that you can maybe put ten people on. Mm -hmm. So I had some guests, and I'm just doing a little Zodiac tour. We're talking about geology and stuff in the ocean, and I sight humpback whale. So we got to go look at it. And then we're like, oh, cool, humpback whale. And then there's more. And humpback whales do not just group together. 
it's like they are not pod animals like the way that dolphins are. Huh. And so I'm like, oh, weird. There's some more. There must be good food here. And then they just keep getting closer and closer and closer together. And I was like, this is not happening. I'm in a zodiac <laughs> at like sea level. Oh. And and then they did it. And I the second they did it, they all did the dive, dive, dive. So they all did a coordinated dive. And I was just like, everybody get your cameras up, watch the birds, because the birds will <laughs> see it before we can. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and get ready, because you're about to see bubble net honey, like bubble netting humpback whales. And it happened. Oh. And we we're in zodiacs. Oh my so like gosh. Ocean level, like half a dozen whales. It was insane. And so then I have to make the radio call and be like, so everybody, we're <laughs> bubble netting humpbacks on the Zodiac right now. And they they were doing like hikes on shore and everything. And they're like, get everyone off the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, who's on board? Can anyone drive another Zodiac? Get another Zodiac out there now. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, send, yeah. send the video person over now. <laughs> yeah. So then eventually they're like, Rachel, come back. You have to come back. We're going to take the whole ship. (laughs) They're like, stop having a good experience. We need to share it. (laughs) And then we got the whole ship to see it. It was really cool. And and it got better, Nick, because there was a mom and like a yearling humpback calf and the baby is like not smart enough yet to bubble net. So (laughs) all the adults are bubble net feeding and the baby's just breaching on the side, (laughs) just jumping, which is jumping out of the water. (laughs) It's just jumping out the water. And so everybody's like, what do we point our cameras at? (laughs) Yes. That must've been very difficult for you. That must be really hard to figure out which which beautiful, amazing thing. (laughs) Should we photograph? And then I said there were two experiences. I know I'm mad. Oh, this one's not as epic. It was actually, you asked for a scary experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And it took me a minute to think of one, but this one scared me. So again, Southeast Alaska, and I was driving a little Zodiac with my little guests and we're circumnavigating this really tiny island. And I'm actually taking them to look at sea lions. They don't know that, but I know that. So I'm like coming around the corner, like kind of going full tilt because it's like round two and I know where they are. So I just want to get there so we can hang out with the sea lions. And I come around the corner and not like, like a bus length in front of me, bubble netting compact whales just explode out of the water. (laughs) I'm like full tilt in a Zodiac coming around the blind corner. And so I'm slowing down immediately, like almost face planting forward because I'm stopping (laughs) so fast. I literally just yelled, hold on. (laughs) And we scared the whales as much as they scared us. And then we were just surrounded by whales and they moved a little bit and bubble netted somewhere else near us. And I was like, well, now do I show them the bubble netting humpback whales or the sea lions? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, that one scared life. me. Yeah, yes. Hard life. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Oh man. And, uh, <laughs> That's all well and good. So let's just switch gears now to something that is maybe make Nick a little less jealous. Who knows? Maybe (laughs) I'm not sure how fond he is of chickens, but I hear that chickens (laughs) is a thing that you do too. (laughs) Chickens. So I have pet chickens um, and I love them. I grew up homeschooled on an alpaca farm and that's as you do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as one does. (laughs) And we had a flock of like 50 chickens. So I've loved chickens since then. And (laughs) yeah, during the pandemic, mental health was a thing. And I was like, I really want chickens. They're just so dumb and they make me happy. (laughs) (laughs) And like, they have really silly personalities and they lay eggs. And you almost have to do nothing to keep them alive because Mm -hmm. they free range in our like jungle outside. And I also was like, I sold it to like my partner and my landlord, I was like, they'll eat the cockroaches and the bugs. And they 100% Mm -hmm. do. There are Mm -hmm. less cockroaches in our life now. Oh, there's a bonus. (laughs) Yes. But I convinced them and our neighbors to get chickens. And then it was really funny because one of my old coworkers like ended up with this abandoned chicken. So I went and picked her up and then she was alone and still sad. So our local... Yeah, our local place that sells plants. I forget what those are called. Nursery things. <laughs> nursery things. You know. works, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nursery yeah, yeah, yeah. Runs with the plants. They got in a bunch of baby hens. And so I went over and 
got two baby hens and gave my sad chicken two little baby hens <laughs> and she was less sad and now i have three chickens <laughs> then you're like i'm going out of town for six weeks who's somebody to take care of these yeah. <laughs> basically yeah and so my partner's like in a love-hate relationship with them because of course, they leave, yeah. they leave poop them. bombs everywhere <laughs> so yeah. yeah i believe it <laughs> you know <laughs> um, but they're also the roaches yeah it's really funny because he'll work on like construction projects outside in the garage and it's like he'll open his trailer of tools and the chicken will jump up on the door and be like what you doing yeah. <laughs> he'll open a tool chest and the chicken will jump in the door it's like can i live here yeah. <laughs> and so they help a lot they they've even laid eggs in his tool chest before so i think it's great <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i bet you do <laughs> oh man well i hate to say this but you know we're almost out of time and uh you know it's it's always tough when we have a fun interview so is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd love to mention before we let you go? Oh man, this was really fun. I think just to anybody that's listening and is interested in any parts of these careers or paths is to just make sure that you put like value on your time because these companies are buying your time. That's what you're selling, you know, when you're making an income and that's, probably the most important thing you have in the world to give or to sell. Yeah. So just make sure it's something that's worth your time and your energy. And, and if it's not, it's okay to, to break free. And I didn't know where I was going for a long time. And I left a lot of opportunities because it wasn't making me happy. And that is kind of the point in life. If you ask me like, what's the meaning of life? It's to be happy. Yeah, and it's a good one. The way you do that is how you spend your time. So making sure you take time to really think about that. Love that. Yeah, that's a great, great end. So last but not least, tell the people where they can find you. Yeah. So social media, my handle is Rachel on the Reef. And mostly you'll find me on Instagram. I don't accept random Facebook friend requests. Sorry, that's where grandma lives. And, <laughs> um, I'm learning about Twitter, but I'm not really somebody that Twitters tweets the words. Yeah, there you go. That yep. is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, and I don't always post because I'm busy, but if you private message me, I will see it. And it does work on Wi-Fi, not cell service. So I see it anywhere I am in the world. Awesome. Thank you awesome. so much for your time, Rachel. It's been really fun. We really enjoyed it. Thanks, Rachel. You are welcome. Thanks so much, Rachel, for joining us today. This was a lot of fun. And I hope I get to have any sort of encounter as awesome as you have on the daily. Okay. Um, please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. And before you go, subscribe, rate, and review. Bye. See you, everybody. <laughs>